Well, thank you very much, Ron, uh, for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I was just uh, saying uh, over lunch that I've been in, at the University of Toronto for 27 years, and this is my first time here at York. So uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to, to, to come to the other half of the equation, if you like. Uh, what I want to do today is talk about some fairly recent work using solution nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And I want to uh, really frame the work by means of the following question, why should we bother with solution NMR? There's a number of different choices that one has if one wants to study uh, large biological molecules. Uh, certainly there's crystallography and cryo-EM and NMR. You might ask, well, why would one choose this particular uh, type of uh, methodology to solve a problem? And what I hope to do today is to convince you of the fact that, in fact, one can get detailed information about molecules. And I want to uh, make use of a molecular machine. So this is a machine that has an aggregate molecular weight on the order of really hundreds of kilodaltons. So very, very large for solution in a Mars spectroscopy. And illustrate the important role of dynamics in this particular m machine's function, both as a healthy machine and also has, as a diseased uh, machine. Now I want to begin by uh, asking you guys a question. Uh, that's actually how I started with my high school students, but I'm going to ask you a different question. I'm going to show you here two pictures. These are both pictures of machines. In the top uh, left-hand uh, corner here, we have a macroscopic machine. This is a machine, a car engine, uh, that's obviously very important to our day-to-day -day, uh, lives. And what I show here is a, another machine. This is a microscopic machine, which is equally important, to perhaps even more important to our day-to-day uh, -day lives. This particular molecular machine is called a proteasome, and it chops up proteins uh, once they've carried out their function. And if I show you these static and very detailed structures, the question is, do you now understand how they work? And it's a bit of a loaded question. Of course, you don't understand how they work, because these are machines. They are made up of moving parts. And to understand how the machines work, you clearly have to be able to see how the parts are going to move. Do you need this closer to me? Oh, it's not on. <laughs> Did he get shut off? Here we go. OK, very good. And so the question is, how do we go about studying these molecular machines? And the problem is that when I wanted to begin this endeavor, there really wasn't any approach to using, for example, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. These machines were simply too big and too complicated to really approach with the technology that was available. So we had to develop the technology first before we could subsequently apply it to uh, interesting applications. So the question is, how do we go about doing that? And the first thing that I want to uh, describe is how do we label our protein molecules in general if we want to study them by NMR? So what I show here by means of a fairly small protein, this happens to be a sarcomology 2 protein, and every one of these white balls is a hydrogen uh, in the protein. You can see there are many hydrogens in the protein, as there are in every single protein. And that's a good thing if we're going to use these white balls as probes of molecular structure and dynamics. You can see that all of these white balls are going to cover completely the structure of the protein. But in fact, having too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, especially as we want to apply the methodology to ever-increasing, ever-complicating, complicated molecules. And that's illustrated by means of the following. Suppose that we're interested in the signal that emanates from this white ball here. Now, every one of these white balls is a hydrogen, and it's a bar magnet. And of course, bar magnets give off little magnetic fields that are then detected by the very large uh, machine, which includes a very big magnetic field that we purchase. And if we look at the signal that emanates from this white ball here, by virtue of the fact that it's proximal to other white balls that, again, remember, are nothing more than little bar magnets that are giving off magnetic fields, these magnetic fields are going to interfere with the signal of interest. And what they're going to do effectively is create a torque which takes the signal of interest back to its equilibrium position. And in NMR, the equilibrium position is no signal. And this process, this torque, if you like, that takes the signal back to a no signal position becomes increasingly strong as a function of molecular weight. So as we go up in size, the signal is going to dissipate ever so uh, more rapidly, and we're not going to be able to record spectra of our large molecular machines for study. And so what we decided to do many years ago was simply to get rid of the white balls in the protein. We would get rid of these hydrogens, 
and he will replace the majority of them with deuterons. Now, deuterons are also little bar magnets, but they're one-tenth as powerful as the hydrogens, as the protons, if you like, in the protein. And as a consequence, the force that they apply to restore the signal back to the equilibrium, no signal position, is much weaker. But if we get rid of all of our white balls, which serve as the signals that we want to use to study our protein, we have a real problem. So what we would decided we would do is we would get rid of the white balls, and then we would introduce white balls in key positions in the protein. And these would be very important positions, and so now the white balls are going to be these magenta uh, balls indicated here. And these magenta balls correspond to methyl groups. So methyl groups are CH3 moieties that are associated with a variety of different amino acids, like isoleucine, leucine, and valine. And what I show are the methyl groups of the isoleucines, leucines, and valines in the context of this protein. And the remaining uh, part of the protein is going to be deuterated. So all of the hydrogens are going to be deuterons. And so that these white balls that are associated with the methyl groups are then going to serve as very strong signals that allow us to detect these uh, important macromolecular complexes. Well, how does one go about producing such proteins? Nowadays, it's very easy. When we started, one couldn't buy these uh, precursors. We had to biosynthetically make them. But now one can just buy a pair of precursors that are shown here. This is ketobutyrate, and this is isovalerate. And this is a precursor for isoleucine. And in particular, the C13H3 methyl group is going to be the precursor for the delta-1 methyl position of isoleucines. And in the context of isovalerate, we have an isopropyl moiety here, and this C13H3 uh, methyl group is going to be uh, the source of our signals uh, for looking at the methyls of leucine and valine. Only one of the two methyls is going to be C13H3. Leucine and valine have two methyl groups, so only one of them is going to be NMR active. That's C13 and H3. The C13 is also a bar magnet. The other methyl is C12D3, and that's NMR inactive. Again, we want to dilute out as many hydrogens as we can so that the force which restores the signal back to the equilibrium position is going to be uh, decreased. And if we add these two precursors into a medium containing our factories for protein overexpression, E. coli, in addition, a deuterated material, D2O and deuterated glucose as a carbon source, at the end of a protein expression, what we get is proteins that are going to be highly deuterated, so silent at almost all of the positions, with the exception of the methyl positions, in this case, isoleucines, leucines, and valines. And each one of these methyls is going to give rise to a dot that you see in this two-dimensional NMR spectrum, which plots the carbon frequency and the proton frequency along the two axes. So in NMR, what we do is we shine radio frequency waves on our sample, and our sample absorbs the energy. And every different methyl group is going to absorb energy at a little bit different frequency by virtue of the unique environments of the methyl groups. And we simply plot the frequencies, the carbon frequency and the proton frequency, by means of this two-dimensional representation. Each one of these dots, therefore, corresponds to an isoleucine or leucine and valine. And therefore, each one of these dots can serve as a little spy, a nuclear spy, into the structure and dynamics of precisely that methyl group uh, and in, of the region uh, in the vicinity of that methyl. So what we have to do is we have to know what dot corresponds to what methyl in the primary amino acid sequence of the protein. So for example, this dot may be isoleucine 650, this iso dot may be isoleucine 12, and so forth. And over the years, we've developed technologies that allow us to assign these dots to methyl groups, and I'm not going to describe that today. So we have now the technology which allows us to generate proteins where these methyl groups are primed as reporters of molecular structure and dynamics. Now, that's not enough. We have to marry this labeling technology with the appropriate spin physics that allows us to preserve the signal, because as we go to larger and larger protein molecules, the signal is going to be uh, dissipated very quickly. And in NMR, we have to buy as a practicing NMR spectroscopist, I have to buy very, very large magnetic fields. And so our success as NMR spectroscopists is dictated by how well we can write CFI grants. But in fact, that's not the complete story. We have to not only deal with the very big magnetic fields for which we need millions of dollars, 
but with the small magnetic fields that manifest by virtue of the fact that the spin spy probes of molecular dynamics and structure, in my case, these methyl groups, these C13H3 methyl groups that consist of four bar magnets, these bar magnets are giving off little magnetic fields. And it's the little magnetic fields which restore the signal of interest back to the equilibrium or no signal position. So I have to be a physicist now and play with these magnetic fields and try to tell them, hey, let me uh, observe the signals that I want to see. And I just want to give you a sort of a picture in your minds about what these fields can look like. And I want to do that in the context of a carbon and a proton. So we have two little bar magnets, perhaps associated with a big protein. And I want to focus on this bar magnet, this hydrogen here, this bar magnet gives off a magnetic field, and you can see the flux lines. This is the large external magnetic field, so it has you know, a $2 million price tag. These little magnetic fields we get for free by virtue of the fact that we're studying these bar magnets that are associated with our proteins. And these little magnetic fields are going to interact with other nuclei, so that if we look at this carbon here, and we look at the signal that emanates from this carbon by virtue of its proximity to protons, and we know in the context of biological molecules we have lots of carbons and protons that are close to one another, the field in this particular example from the protons is going to affect the carbon and restore the carbon magnetization, the carbon signal back to the no signal position. So how can we circumvent this process from occurring? This is a very natural uh, uh, process that occurs. So if we forget about uh, spin physics for a moment and just look at a typical NMR experiment, and what I show here is an NMR signal. This is a one-dimensional spectrum where we have a peak of a methyl, say, that is associated with a big protein molecule. And what we're doing is we're looking at the peak associated with the methyl in a protein molecule as a function of increasing sizes of the protein. So this would be for a small protein, and you can see a beautiful, nice, sharp peak. But as the protein molecular weight increases, and we're going to be dealing with very large proteins in what I have to say subsequently, the signal becomes smaller, and eventually it just uh, melts into the noise. Where this happens on the molecular weight scale, which is shown along the x-axis, really depends on the system that one is studying. But it would certainly be before any big sizes uh, of the sort that we would wish to look at. So maybe 30 or 40 kilodaltons, maybe 300 residues or so, we would lose the signal completely. In contrast, if we recognize that what we have to do is manipulate magnetic fields, and the fact that our spin spy probes, again, are made up of these methyl groups, which have four fields, one carbon and three protons. And if you remember, fields, like magnetic fields or electrical fields, there can be vectorial, and they add or subtract depending on the direction of the fields. And so what we really want to do is, using spin physics, is we want to select those methyl groups where the fields are going to subtract from one another. Because if we can decrease the fields, then we don't have the restoring force or the restoring torque, which brings the signal back to the no signal position. And in so doing, playing games with physics, we can preserve the signals in a way that immortalizes the signal so that we can apply our methodologies to ever-increasing sizes of molecular complexes. And that's just shown here, where um, I have the uh, NMR peak um, as a function of molecular weight. And you can see that even for high molecular weight systems, uh, there is still a substantial peak that we can exploit to be able to learn something about our system. And we can apply this methodology to a variety of different protein systems. This is an application uh, that's now over probably 12 or 13 years, where we're applying this uh, technology to the proteasome, which is 670 kilodaltons. We can also apply this technology to the nucleosome, whereby we have methyl groups in each of the four different histones. And we've been able to assign all of the uh, methyls in the histones, which then serve as reporters of molecular structure and dynamics. And epigenetic modifications, and so forth. But what I want to speak to you about today is a protein called P97. P97 is a very important uh, molecule that's involved in a plethora of different biological processes, which can be grouped under the heading of proteostasis. So P97 is involved in ensuring the uh, protein health of the cell. And what P97 does, and that's shown here in red, and then I put the proteasome in the middle, and this is a biophysicist rendition of a cell, and you can tell that it's a biophysicist who drew it because I even got rid of the nucleus and things of that sort, um, is, um, is as follows. So what P97 does is P97 takes proteins that are past their prime, 
in terms of the fact that they've carried out their biological function or that are diseased or mutated and what have you, and transfers them to the proteasome for degradation. And it can do that by extruding, for example, proteins from biological membranes. It can push the proteins out of biological membranes via a process called ERAD, if it's the endoplasmic reticulum or mitochondria-assisted degradation, pushes those proteins out, chaperones those proteins to the proteasome. It can also be involved in taking large proteinaceous complexes that, for example, might be associated with uh, DNA damage repair. After the DNA damage repair has occurred, uh, the damage has been repaired, you've got to disassemble these proteinaceous com complexes, and P90 P97 can pull out proteins from them and then transfer them to the proteasome for degradation. P97 is also involved in membrane fusion. And it's involved in non-proteasome uh, protein degradation pathways like those that make use of the lysosome. And the story that I want to tell you about today involves disease mutations that impair the lysosomal degradation pathway. Now, P97 carries out a whole bunch of different functions, and the question is, how does it know what it's supposed to be doing and when? And the answer is that there's a large number of adapter molecules. In the human cell, there's over 40 different adapter molecules that interact with P97, so around 40 molecules binding to P97 and directing P97 to specific biological functions. So there would be one class of adapter molecule that would interact with P97 and tell it, hey, you've got to get involved in lysosomal degradation, or another class that might be involved in Golgi membrane dynamics and so forth, or another class that's involved in ERAD. And so, we would like to be able to understand how P97 is able to function, interact with various adapter molecules, and carry out the plethora of different biological activities. Now, P97 uses ATP hydrolysis to power its function. Roughly 1 to 2 percent of cellular proteins are P97, and 20 to 40 percent of the ATP usage in a typical human cell is attributed to the functionalities of P97. P97 is also involved in other roles. It's a signaling hub for not only bringing together ubiquitinated protein molecules, but then dispersing them uh, in various directions in the cell. Uh, it's involved in the transport of substrates to different regions of the cell. And I've already mentioned that it serves as a desegregase, breaking apart complexes uh, after they carry out their function. Let me introduce the molecular players in today's talk. Uh, not surprisingly, P97, given its importance, has received a lot of attention from biologists. There's something like two or three papers per day that are published on P97. Uh, in addition, it's received a lot of attention from structural biologists. And what I show here are some of the beautiful crystal structures that have been produced of this molecule. So P97 is a half a megadalton, which is quite a big molecular machine. And it's comprised of repeats of six repeats of a polypeptide chain. So there are six protomers that are associated with this 540 kilodalton molecular machine. Each of the protomers, in turn, is comprised of 806 amino acids. And each protomer is made up of three domains, an N-terminal domain, and then a pair of domains D1 and D2, which combine, which bind the nucleotides, which power the function. Now, D1 and D2 are going to be arranged in a double donut structure. So what you have here is the top donut. That's a D1 donut. And then the bottom donut is a D2 donut. And then you have the N-terminal domains, or the arms of the P97 molecule. And in the ADP form, these arms are going to be planar, coplanar, with the uh, donut that is shown here, with the top ring, the D1 ring. We've also worked with a smaller uh, version of the protein. It turns out that one can get rid of the bottom donut and still use uh, what's the remaining top donut as a, as a very good model for a lot of the studies that we want to do. This is, this is now 320 kilodaltons in molecular weight, uh, shown here. And again, in the ADP form, the N-terminal domains are going to be down, so coplanar with the ring. And in the ATP form, the N-terminal domains are going to be above the plane of the ring. So you can see that the blue uh, domains are above the plane of the ring here and in the plane of the ring here. And I'll denote that schematically throughout my talk by showing uh, the, these cartoons here, where I'm only going to show one of the six uh, arms, or one of the six N-terminal domains in blue here, connected via a green linker to the 
D1 uh, protomer in the down position ADP or in the up position ATP. And if we rotate the molecules by 90 degrees, you can see the beautiful hexameric structure that is associated uh, with P97. Now, this up-down equilibrium that is uh, regulated through the hydrolysis of ATP is thought to be very important for the function of P97. And it's thought to be very important because these N-terminal domains indicated in blue, and remember there are six of them around the uh, circumference of this uh, hexameric structure, these N-terminal domains are going to interact with substrate molecules or with adapter molecules that then in turn uh, bring substrate to uh, P97. So what's thought to happen, although there's not a lot of evidence yet, certainly not a lot of structural evidence, is that upon hydrolysis of ATP, when it goes from an up to a down position, that much is known. But the force that is produced is going to be used, for example, to pull out protein molecules that are associated with the N-terminal domain that are bound to it or bound to adapters from, uh, say, biological membranes. So you generate a force, you pull out the protein from a biological membrane, and in this way, P97 is thought to desegregate. Uh, these molecules from their environment. Again, the structural basis for how this occurs is not well established and uh, constitutes some of the ongoing experiments in my laboratory. Not surprisingly, given the importance of P97, it's implicated in disease, both uh, cancer and neurodegeneration. And what I show here is, again, this hexameric structure, and I want to focus your attention on this uh, rectangle here, which we're going to blow up. You can see in blue the N-terminal domain. You can see in red a portion of the D1 domain. And then you can see the nucleotide uh, indicated here. This is ADP. And at the interface between the blue and the pink, that is to say the N-terminal domain and D1, I've highlighted a number of positions in yellow whose mutation, and only a single uh, mutation is necessary, uh, generates uh, disease mutations generates disease. So these would be diseases that are associated with neurodegeneration, a series of diseases that involve the bone, the bones that involve cognition, that involve the musculature. And these are all diseases that are associated with the lysosomal degradation pathway. And so what we would like to be able to do then is to understand the molecular basis by which these uh, disease mutations function. How is it that one particular mutation at a given site can give rise to a disease. What is it about the biophysics of the molecules that is changed upon uh, mutation? And so our approach is going to be to take the labeling methodologies that we've developed, to take the spin physics that we've developed, and to try to uh, address the question that relates to uh, disease and, uh, and uh, mutations. And we want to take advantage of a 320 kilodalton single uh, construct. This is the single ring construct. But at the same time, once we get a result, we're going to test it with the uh, full length 540 kilodalton protein. The first thing that one has to do in any NMR uh, sort of study is verify that one can get spectra. We have to be able to get data. The data have to be high quality. We're dealing with a very large system now. And so this is an example of an NMR spectrum that we've recorded, a carbon proton two-dimensional map where each of these dots corresponds to a methyl group in the protein. And we've been able to assign something like 97% of these spots to particular methyl groups in the primary amino acid sequence of the protein. So we know, for example, that this isoleucine comes from isoleucine 274 as a prerequisite to asking questions about specific regions in the protein. So isoleucine 274 is going to be a reporter of that particular position, but also regions around that particular position. So we have a large number of points to begin to ask questions about uh, structure and dynamics. And we've also assigned something like 80% of the uh, methyl uh, positions, 80% of the dots, in spectra recorded of the ATP form of this particular protein. But the question that I want to ask is, why should we bother with NMR spectroscopy? I've taken the first 15 minutes of my talk to show you some beautiful structures produced by X-ray crystallography. And now with the development of cryo-EM, there are even more beautiful uh, pictures that emerge from that technology. So why should we bother with NMR when there are such pretty pictures from X-ray and cryo-EM? And I think the answer is illustrated on this slide here. There are beautiful structures, but these structures are static. 
And protein molecules are dynamic. They're kicking, they're screaming, they're interacting with their environment, they're moving their parts, just like a car engine has to move its parts. If you stop a car engine uh, from moving its parts, you're not going to go. Your car's not going to work. But you're certainly not going to get any insight into how that engine might work. Let me just illustrate that by means of the following. What I show in black are three structures determined by x-ray crystallography of the ATP form of P97. This is the wild type. And then we have R155H. That's a moderate disease mutation. And then we have a very serious disease mutation, R95G. And if one looks at the structures, you can see that they look really very similar. Now, one can go into the details of the structural biology, and maybe you can convince yourself that there are subtle details that are different between the wild type and disease. But none of the differences really correlate with disease severity. So you're sort of at loss as to how it is that these mutations can cause such uh, devastating uh, disease. Similar situation occurs in the context of the ADP form of the protein. Shown here in red, we have the wild type protein, a couple of different disease mutants. And these N-terminal domains are now going to be planar with the ring. But if one looks at the structures, they look very similar, and one gets very little insight about how uh, disease mutants carry out uh, their effects. Clearly, there are differences between the ADP and the ATP form that uh, manifest in this up-down equilibrium. The hands, or the N-terminal domains, are up for ATP and down for ADP. But no information about the uh, structural basis of diseases obtained from these beautiful structures, albeit ones that are static. And so we uh, naively thought that perhaps we could bring to bear our NMR technology to address this situation. So as a first example, what we did is we compared the NMR spectrum of the wild type protein with a very severe disease mutant. So that's shown here. The very severe disease mutant is in blue, an R95G disease mutant. The wild type protein is in black. And in both cases, this is the ATP loaded form of the protein. And we've recorded spectra of each. And then we superimpose the spectra. And you can see wherever you see a blue dot, you also see a black dot, and vice versa. And if we do an NMR experiment of two proteins, for example, and the spectra are exactly the same, that means that the two proteins are also identical. So what we can conclude here is that there's no structural differences in the ATP form between wild type and disease, confirming what was already known by uh, crystallography. So in that sense, we've learned absolutely nothing from this uh, NMR experiment. But seeing as I had already purchased the equipment and it was paid for, we decided that we couldn't quit there. And so we thought that we would look at the ADP state of the P97 molecule. And here is where we found something really very interesting. This slide is a bit complicated. What it is is a superposition of many of spectra from many spectra, from, for, uh, spectra from many different mutants. So what I show here is isoleucine-146. So we're looking at a methyl group from isoleucine 146, a methyl group from isoleucine 149. For various forms of P97 or isoleucine 274, valine 87, there's lots of different methyl probes. And they all are saying the same thing. So what are they telling us? Well, let's focus on isoleucine 189. This red peak here corresponds to isoleucine 189 in the wild type version of the protein ADP state. So that's when the N-terminal domains are going to be down. By contrast, this black peak here corresponds to the wild type protein in the ATP state when the N-terminal domains are up. So you can see that we get very different signatures depending on whether these N-terminal domains are up or down. And then what I show here, these other peaks correspond to isoleucine 189 in different disease mutants in the ADP state. So we go from this yellow peak, which is a disease mutant in the ADP state, all the way up to a very severe disease mutant in the ADP state as well. So all of these are ADP state. And what's really quite remarkable is the titration of peaks, if you like, the progression from red to black or from N-terminal domain down to N-terminal domain up is associated with disease severity. So these are very moderate disease mutations, and these are very severe disease mutation. So as a function of increasing disease severity in the ADP form, where these N-terminal domains are all supposed to be down in the wild type situation, the N-terminal domains are going up. 
So how do I know that? Well, let me give you a little bit of an NMR lesson uh, to tell you how we can look at these spectra and conclude that we have an equilibrium that is being perturbed as a function of disease mutation. I want you to consider P97 now not as a static molecule, it is typically depicted by a cryo-EM or X-ray crystallography, but as a dynamic molecule. And I want you to think about it as a dynamic molecule that interconverts between two states. A state where the N-terminal domain is going to be down, and a state where the N-terminal domain is going to be up. Now this is in the ADP state. I'm talking about the ADP state right now. And we know that this interconversion happens at a rate that is greater than 15,000 times per second because we've developed NMR experiments that allow us to measure that. So the rate is very fast. Let's suppose that we could stop the rate. So we could freeze the molecule. So we have some molecules like this and some molecules that are like this. And then we record spectra. Well, what we'll find is that the methyl groups associated with this type of molecule give rise to a peak. And the methyl groups that are associated with this type of molecule give rise to a separate peak. And the peaks are distinct because the structures are different. But if we have very rapid interconversion between the structures, then we just get one peak, which is a bland, a mixture, if you like, of the two peaks that would normally occur in the absence of this rapid dynamics. And what we can learn from the position of the peaks, because the position of the peaks is going to be given by a population weighted average of how much of this structure and how much of this structure are going to be interconverting. We can learn from the position of the peaks the relative equilibrium shift. So if we have the two reference anchor points, this is NTD down, this is NTD up, and these are various disease mutants, simply by looking at the position of this yellow peak, we know that the NTDs are mostly down, but a little bit up. Now there's a rapid interconversion. It's not a static situation. There's an interconversion that is happening rapidly, but it's involving mostly a mixture of red and just a little bit of black. And then as we go to more severe disease mutations, the situation is reversed. So we can assay the thermodynamics that are associated with disease. Now, I've told you, and in fact, the NMR is unequivocal, that what we really have is N-terminal domains, which are moving between down and up very rapidly. And it's just that as a function of disease mutation, the population is increasing towards the up state. But there's very rapid equilibrium. Now, you might say that you don't believe the NMR. You much prefer biochemistry. And since we wanted to appeal to a medical audience, we decided to do some biochemical experiments. It would really prove that it's a dynamic sort of thing. In other words, as a function of disease mutation, you don't have a static structure where the N-terminal domains just continue to move up in a static sort of way, but really a dynamic structure. And let me introduce how you, you did these experiments. So there's a couple of amino acids, 155 and 387, and they're very close to one another in the down form of the protein, but not in the up form. And so we just exchanged the arginine and asparagine with cysteines. Now, if we look at the wild-type protein, and remember the wild-type protein is in the down form, so these two amino acids are going to be very close to one another. So under reducing conditions, where we don't form this uh, disulfide between the two cysteines, we get the red spectra. And then under oxidizing conditions, we get the spectra that are indicated here, the gray peaks. Okay, so when we oxidize, the red peaks move a little bit, but they don't move too much because in the wild type ADP state, it's already a down conformation. And these two residues, in this case cysteines, are close to one another. Now let's look at a very severe disease mutant like R95G in the context of this double mutation where we have introduced a pair of cysteines. Now if R95G mutation, and I've said that it's an equilibrium that is happening very quickly, if in fact that's not the case, if it's just right in the middle between up and down but a static structure, then these two cysteines one, from 155 and 387 are not going to be very close to one another. So under oxidizing and reducing conditions, there's no, not going to be any difference because we can't form the disulfide. The two cysteines aren't close enough to form a disulfide. And there'll be no change in the NMR spectrum. By contrast, if we have a dynamic equilibrium, then every time the N-terminal domains go into the down state, the two cysteines are going to be proximal. And under oxidizing conditions, we're going to get an oxidized molecule, that is to say, a down state. So we're going to be forcing the equilibrium towards the down conformation. And we should see a change in our spectrum. And that's exactly what we see. So under reducing 
conditions, we have the blue peaks. Under oxidizing conditions, where the two cysteines form, which shifts the equilibrium from being roughly 50-50 to down, you can see that the blue peak moves all the way down here and all the way over here, much the same positions as the uh, peaks are here in the cross-linked form. So this really provides additional evidence for those of you who have never been convinced by NMR of the fact that we have a dynamic equilibrium. This is not something that is static. This is disease that is associated with uh, molecular dynamics and impaired dynamics, if you like. So just to uh, illustrate that a little bit more, what we have as a, as a function of disease severity, the wild-type protein, we have an equilibrium between down and up. This is all in the ADP state, but the equilibrium heavily favors the down state. But as a function of increasing uh, disease severity, the equilibrium is going to be shifted such that the N-terminal domains are now going to be up. So we have dysregulation of this very important up-down equilibrium. Well, I've told you that P97 is a very important molecule, uh, and we wanted to uh, understand how downstream this up-down equilibrium uh, could affect its functions. And in particular, uh, the disease mutants that we're looking at are associated with lysosomal degradation. And so we wanted to see how the adapter, which causes P97 to go into a mode that's involved in lysosomal degradation, how that adapter is, uh, uh, interacts with P97 in these disease mutants. Is there some sort of impaired binding that uh, is uh, brought about by these disease mutations? And so what we did is we carried out the following experiment. Here we have P97. And here we have the adapter. It's called UBXD1. And the adapter has two critical regions. These two critical regions are going to bind to P97. We know that from the NMR experiments in a two-pronged binding mode kind of association. So we have something called a VIM domain on UBXD1. It's this yellow circle here. And that binds to the N-terminal domain, the blue circle here. And then we have this triangle here, this H1H2 domain, which is going to nestle in between the D1 ring and the N-terminal domain is shown here. And we have a large number of methyl groups which we can serve as probes of this interaction. So despite the fact that we have a two-pronged interaction, certain methyl groups are going to report on one of the prongs, and other methyl groups are going to report on the second prong. So what we've done in this slide is we've looked at the wild-type protein, and I've recorded an NMR experiment of, on P97 in the APO form, so that's in the absence of UBXD1, and that's indicated here in red. And then I've added UBXD1 to form a complex. And what happens if we look at valine 68? Valine 68 methyl group reports on the interaction between yellow and blue. And you can see that the peak for valine 68, 68 moves from this red position here to the gray position here. This is the bound position. So just by looking at the NMR spectrum, we know that there's an interaction. The interaction involves yellow with blue. But if we look at isoleucine 189 and 146, these two isoleucines are probes of the up-down equilibrium. Now, we're dealing with the wild-type protein here in the ADP form, so what's already down. So we, we only have slight changes in the red peaks as they move to the gray position to form this down-locked conformation. One of the nice things that one can do by NMR spectroscopy is one can learn where the binding actually occurs. So what I show here, again, is the hexameric structure. And I'm focusing on this region here, uh, which I've blown up. So this is the N-terminal domain. This is the D1 domain. And then I've painted in yellow the region where the VIM domain is going to bind to the N-terminal domain. So this is where this yellow circle binds to the blue circle, if you like. And there, where this red triangle binds is indicated in this deep red uh, color here. So it binds at the interface between the N-terminal domain and D1. Now, as a function of increasing disease mutant, what we're doing is we're distorting this interface. This interface is present in the down state, but as the hands move upwards, as the N-terminal domains move up, the interface is going to be disturbed. Now, if the interface is exactly where this H1H2 domain binds, it stands to reason that as a function of disease mutation, where we've increasingly disturbed this interface, we're going to do uh, we're going to destroy one of the uh, prongs of binding. And so we wanted to test that for the disease mutants. And that's shown on this slide here. So again, it's the same experiment that I described on the previous slide. We're looking at the interaction 
of P97 with UBXD1 as a function of increasing disease severity. What I show here in this panel is what I had in the previous slide. So let's focus on these four panels here, R155H and N387H. These are two disease mutants that are fairly moderate. And then the R95G and the R155P are two disease mutants that are very severe. So let's focus on R155H. What you see in orange is the spectrum of P97 focused on a number of different methyl groups, the same ones as the previous slide, in the APO form, so without UBXD1. And then we're going to add UBXD1 to get the black spectrum. So you can see that the orange peak moves to the black peak. So that indicates, since we're looking at valine 68, which reports on the interaction between yellow and blue, that there still is an interaction in moderate disease mutants. What I show here in gray are going to be the positions of the peaks in the wild type complex. So essentially taken from here. So you can see that while the yellow, the orange peak moves to the black position, it's not nearly as uh, significant a motion of the peak as we would get uh, for the wild type situation. And so that indicates that there is some binding, but the binding is not as strong. And the same thing happens for isoleucine 189 and 146 that report on the up-down equilibrium. <clears throat> the binding is, again, not as strong because you can see that here's the position of where the wild type complex would be for these peaks. And we just have a little bit of movement from the uh, orange APO position to the uh, position in black that we get upon addition of UBXD1. If one looks at very severe disease mutants now, like R95G, and the blue peaks correspond to the APO form, just P97, and then the black peaks correspond to the situation when we've added the adapter UBXD1, and the gray peaks that you can barely see here and here correspond by means of reference to what happens for the wild type protein. You can see that valine 68 reports that there is binding. So yellow and blue still interact, not as strongly as they did for the wild type protein, but they still interact. In contrast, the blue and black peaks are completely superimposed for isoleucine 189 and 146. Now isoleucine 189 and 146 report on the up-down equilibrium. And so what that tells us is upon binding of UBXD1, that up-down equilibrium is not perturbed whatsoever. And therefore, there's no interaction with the second prong. Because the second prong, when it interacts, when this prong interacts with P97, it locks the structure into a down state. So since this prong is not interacting, and we can see that because these peaks report no interaction, we know as a function of increasing disease mutation, while yellow interacts with blue, Unfortunately, this wedge here no longer is able to form key interactions which lock the structure into a down conformation, which presumably is important uh, for function. P97 is a highly plastic molecule. It's a very dynamic molecule. I've told you about the up-down equilibrium at the level of the arms, the end terminal domains. In fact, one can do additional experiments whereby we can probe uh, dynamics over a broad spectrum of time scales. And P97 is really squishy. So if P97 is really squishy, we thought, well, perhaps we might be able to take a disease mutant and to squish it, if you like, back into the uh, wild type uh, structure. So how does one go about doing that? And I want to focus your attention now on a series of disease mutants at position 155. So these are disease mutants where arginine is replaced by either a cysteine or a proline. And then we ask the following question. Could we search for other positions in the protein that are proximal to 155 in the down state, but far away in the up state? So is there a position in the down state that if we mutated it, we could form favorable interactions with position 155 that would stabilize the down state, but would have no effect on the up state? It turns out that uh, there is a position residue 387, that when we mutate the wild type N to a cysteine, we achieve that result. Let me just show you the uh, evidence for that. So here we have isoleucine 189, again, a reporter of the up-down equilibrium. And in black and red, by means of reference, I show the position of peaks for the wild type protein, where NTDs are either 100% up, so that's ATP, or 100% down, that's ADP. 
And then R155C, very severe disease mutant in the ADP form, gives rise to this peak for isoleucine-189, which is sort of halfway in between up and down. If we add an additional mutation at position 387, which is a revertant, then we can shift the equilibrium from this blue peak all the way down, very close to the red peak. So we shift the equilibrium from being roughly 50-50 up to now essentially 100% down, and we're able to restore wild-type function. So we're able to use the squishiness of the protein, at least in vitro, as a test of whether we can manipulate the equilibrium and henceforth uh, restore function. Now it turns out that the diseases that I've talked to you about are autosomal dominant. And so essentially what that means is that when the two alleles that code for P97, if they're both going to be uh, homozygous for mutants, uh, the individual is not viable. And so all patients contain one copy of wild type and one copy of a disease mutant. And in vivo and in vitro work that we've done and also work before us has shown that when you have a mixture of a wild type and a mutant uh, pair of alleles, then the P97 molecules that you get, remember that P97 is going to be hexameric, so some of the protomers are going to be wild type and some of them are going to be disease mutants. So we really ought to not focus on looking at situations where all of the protomers are a given type, let's say all wild type or all disease, but rather where there's a mixture of both wild type and disease protomers to see what happens in that case, because that's the case that occurs in nature. So just to make that clear, what I've told you about till now are protomers that look like this. They're either all gray, so they're all wild type, or maybe they're all R95G, or they're all double mutants of R95G and T262A in this particular case. And then from the position of peaks in spectra, we can simply read off the fraction of the upstate of the N-terminal domains. So now what I want to do is a different sort of experiment. I want to take a mixture. So let's suppose that I have wild type protein here, and I have, say, R95G disease mutant here. So orange is going to be R95G disease mutant. And I simply mix these two. I unfold the proteins, and then I refold them to create various combinations of white and orange protomers. And suppose further that the orange protomers indicated here, say of a disease mutant, are going to be labeled with our NMR probes. So the methyl groups are going to be C13H3. Remember, that's what we're looking at. But the protomers that are white here are going to be NMR invisible. So we're only going to be able to detect signals from this R95G disease protomer. So then we ask ourselves the following question. Let's do an experiment, again, say, focusing on isoleucine 189 methyl group. I show down here and up here the two positions for the wild type ADP and the wild type ATP situation. And then what I have here is I have an R95G disease mutant where all of the neighbors, all of the surrounding neighbors are going to be wild type. This is in the ADP state. Here's an R95G disease mutant. Again, remembering I'm only looking at the signals from this filled in protomer, but the environment of all of the other protomers in this particular case is R95G. Here, I'm looking at the R95G protomer in orange, but all of the other protomers are going to be blue corresponding to double mutants. And you can see that the N-terminal domains are going to change their orientation depending on environment. So there's crosstalk between one protomer and the neighboring protomer. So one can learn something by NMR about the interactions between protomers, the inter-protomer interaction. And what we can conclude by this experiment is as follows. If we look at a disease a mutant protomer, in this particular case a very severe R95G disease mutant, the up-down equilibrium is going to be shifted depending on the neighbors. So if the neighbors are essentially all down, that's going to shift the equilibrium for the disease mutant partially down. If the neighbors are much more up than what the disease mutant normally would be, that's going to influence the disease mutant, and the N-terminal domains are going to go up. Now this is a very subtle influence. We're talking about energy differences, and we can calculate the energy differences from these numbers percentage up that I report here. We're talking about energy differences of a kcal per mole. 
If you look at a hydrogen bond in a protein, a strong hydrogen bond can be three or four or five kcals per mole. These are subtle differences that are 20% of a hydrogen bond, and yet they're responsible for very significant differences in terms of disease severity. So what has subtle effects in the free energy landscape that can significantly affect the up-down equilibrium, and hence binding of adapters, and hence biological function, it turns out that disease mutants are going to respond to their neighbor protomers. If the neighbor protomers are going to be mostly wild type, then that's going to restore some wild type character to the disease mutant. And if these disease mutants are surrounded by even more diseased mutants, if you like, then that's going to make the disease mutant even more uh, disease than it would normally be. And the question is, well, how does that affect function? And we can do an experiment, like I've told you about before, a binding assay, where we're looking at P97 associated with UBXD1. So what I have here, all of the protomers are red. This is a disease mutant. This is the R95G disease mutant. And we're going to add UBXD1. So in green are going to be the peaks that we get from P97 in the absence of UBXD1. And then in purple are going to be the peaks when we add this adapter. Valine 68 and isoleucine 175 that report on the interaction with this yellow VIM domain with the N-terminal domain show shifts in peaks. That indicates that there is the interaction. But isoleucine 189 and 146, the green and the purple peaks don't move. That's because that's telling us that there's no interaction involving the triangle with the second prong. But now let's look at a situation where we have this R95G disease mutant protomer. And again, that's the protomer that we're focusing, focusing on. In an NMR, we can zoom in on one protomer because it's going to be labeled in a sea of other wild-type protomers. Now, the hypothesis would be, since the wild-type protomers are going to exert, if you like, a good influence on the disease mutant protomer and lower the uh, N-terminal domain towards the down position, towards the wild-type position, but not completely at the wild-type position, that we should partially be able to restore uh, wild-type uh, binding. And in fact, we can see that, in addition to the fact that we know from valine 68 and isoleucine 175 that report on the first prong involving VIM, that, that there's an interaction there. We also know, looking at isoleucine 189 and 146, now you can see that the green peaks move to the purple peaks upon the addition of UBXD1, indicating that there's now partial contact that's being restored at the level of the second uh, prong of the binding interaction. So as we shift the equilibrium, be it through a disease, uh, be it through a, a revertant mutant that acts on the disease mutant, or by virtue of the fact that the neighboring residues are having, if you like, a good influence on the disease mutant, we can also restore uh, some function. So let me uh, just conclude. Uh, what I've told you about today in, in terms of uh, P97 involves a series of disease mutants that can be categorized as ranging between weak and strong on the basis of age of onset and relative elevation of various disease markers. The biophysics of the disease is that this equilibrium that involves the N-terminal domains, which is very important for the binding of adapter molecules and further uh, function of the uh, P97 uh, molecule, this equilibrium is going to be uh, shifted to the right, even in the ADP form, so one gets this uh, errant or aberrant up conformation. This aberrant up conformation then weakens the interactions with appropriate uh, adapter molecules that are involved in the, dis the lysosomal uh, disease that I've told you about. And then we can play with the plasticity of the P97 molecule. We can introduce a revertent mutation or at the level of the surrounding protomers to shift the equilibrium back towards the wild type and hence to restore wild type uh, like binding. So hopefully in the last hours or so, I've been able to convince you of the fact that by going from very basic research, where we've had to worry about the quantum mechanics associated with uh, NMR spectroscopy to get the signal that we needed to be able to study macromolecular machines, we can then apply this technology to understand how these machines work. And while there are other technologies that give beautiful structures, it's really going to be a combination, I think, of all of the technologies that are available to us as structural biologists to be able to span the gamut from static structure on the one hand all the way to function. And I think that the bridge between those two is going to be provided by 
molecular dynamics, and NMR is going to be well poised to providing that information. Let me conclude my talk by thanking the two people who have done the work and a former postdoc in the lab who is now uh, a group leader in Germany and Ray who has continued her work. I thank them and you for your kind attention. So we have time for a few questions, um, both so everybody can hear the question and because we are taping it, people who have questions would please go to the microphone, one on each side. Can I just speak? Uh, I'll project. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'm going to ask the, uh, the mean question. Um, if you label the protein with tons of deuterium, are you worried that that's going to perturb the equilibrium or the dynamics, given that the hydrogen bonding that will be going on will be substantially different? Yeah, so, briefly repeat so the so question is, the labeling scheme that we use involving uh, substitution of protons for deuterons, how does that affect the uh, function of the molecule? So uh, if you look at the, and in general, there can be changes to the stabilities of protein molecules when you deuterate. Uh, the changes tend to be fairly small when one's dealing with very stable molecules, as we are here. Remember, we're looking at a hexamer, so we have literally thousands of square angstroms of sequestered uh, surface area between one protober and the next, so we have a very stable complex. We can show in the wild-type version of the protein, for example, that it binds to uh, adapters, as one would expect, not only to uh, the UBXD1, but to other adapters that are involved in a whole uh, different set of biological uh, uh, processes. So you do have the, 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 the interactions between uh, the molecules are not perturbed uh, significantly through the use of deuteration. And then these mutations do uh, create changes. So we're looking at our baseline, if you like, is going to be deuterated molecules. And we're looking at changes with respect to those deuterated molecules. I can also tell you that the affinities for interactions that we measure by NMR are very similar to the affinities for the interactions that others measure uh, on uh, protonated uh, systems. So I don't think that there we're talking about very significant uh, energy differences. Of course, things can be quite subtle, and subtle energy differences are important. And I think it's important that you compare things, you know, apples with apples. So we're comparing our deuterated proteins with our, with our uh, deuterated proteins, uh, with our, you know, deuterated mutated proteins. Um, so I think that there is a, a baseline reference that is, that is fairly reasonable in this particular case. We also know that we see the exact similar changes that one would expect to see on the basis of, say, crystallography. If you look at the ATP form where the N-terminal domains are up, we see that up situation. And we don't see any uh, changes to that up situation as a function of disease mutant, just like the crystallographers did not. So. Um, you know, I think that every technology has its limitations in crystallography. Of course, one works at liquid nitrogen temperatures. One could argue that liquid nitrogen temperatures are not the most physiologic. And one also adds a whole bunch of different agents to, uh, to um, uh, stabilize the, 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 you know, the crystals, to get crystals to form. But I think that um, if one does enough careful studies, one can uh, sort of begin to assure oneself that one's looking at something that's real. And certainly, the, the fact that we see crystallography, cryo-EM, and NMR converge at least on some of the structural details, although other structural details, like the up-down equilibrium, are not provided by the other uh, techniques um, to this point, uh, that one can get some confidence that the perturbations that one has to make, if you like, to be able to see these molecules in the first place are not pathologic. Beautiful work. So do you think that this disease is viable because uh, the effect, uh, the net effect when you have the, 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 uh, the, the, the multimer, I, I don't remember how many are there, is because the shift is towards the normal. The more you have, uh, uh, because of the normal component, you're shifting the, the, the molecule down. And, it, and the reason why I'm asking, are there mutations where you don't see this shift down the more you, uh, based on the presence of normal uh, molecules? Right, so there, it, 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 it's an interesting question. So there are various types, so there's a whole bunch of different diseases. 
And there's a, a large number of mutations, and many, many of them show this shift in equilibrium that, that, that correlates with disease severity. There are other mutations that are far re removed uh, from this class in terms of where they're localized, or mutations that are in the second domain, where there isn't a perturbation in the up-down equilibrium. And in fact, in terms of the nature of the, the phenotype of the, the disease, if you like, uh, there are differences to this class. So I think there's a whole bunch of different diseases. They won't all involve this up-down equilibrium, but there's a big class that actually do. Did you, P53 is another molecule I'm very interested in and has multiple mutation. And there is a lot of questions regarding what is, a, is it loss of function or is it a gain of function with the mutant form? Would you think that your NMR would be able to address some of those questions? Absolutely. I mean, we can look at all sorts of uh, different structures, aberrant structures by NMR. Uh, I've actually worked with P53 and, and, and uh, played around a little bit with it in disease mutants. Some of the work that uh, we did with, with Cheryl Aerosmith, actually, as we were developing the NMR technologies. We've looked at proteins like superoxide dismutase, where, you know, that are heavily implicated in, in, in ALS. And what we actually see is, is these disease mutations give rise to aberrant structures uh, not structures of the predominant conformations in solution, but if you look uh, a little bit above an energy from these dominant, from the dominant conformation that you would pick out via crystallography or really uh, traditional sorts of NMR approaches, you can see a rich landscape of a lot of dynamics that these mutations cause. In other words, just taking a snapshot, the structure looks particularly fine, looks very happy. But then if you ask, well, what are these higher energy, you know, what does the landscape look like? Is the structure just sitting there or is it dancing around other structures that potentially could serve as seeds for aggregation? You find that these disease mutants have a lot more of a, of a kick to them, a lot more of a dance to them. We've been able to, via NMR, characterize what these structures would look like. Now, that's very hard to do because these structures are populated at a half a percent of the time and they're, um, they're really very transient. So they're low population, they're transiently formed. Most technologies would not be able to see these structures, but there are NMR techniques that are out there where you can begin to look uh, sort of above the, 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 the base where you have the majority of structures and ask questions about what these disease mutants, often what these disease mutants are doing is not perturbing the stable structure, but, but influencing the number of other structures that are accessible to the stable structure. I mean, we have examples uh, for P97 where a disease mutant just you know, creates a, a population of, say, 10% of, 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 of a, you know effective aberrant structure. So it's, it's mostly wild type, but there's a little bit of non-wild type character there, which is enough to, to set off the disease. How to be able to see that has always been difficult because you're talking about a small fraction that can be short-lived. Not, you know, this was 10%, it's easy to see, but if it's 0.1% and if it's broadened out because the lifetime is so short, then you've got other problems. And NMR is really good at being able to detect these, these uh, invisible states. Um, I just wonder if I heard you correctly. When you said when you made the, uh, well, I guess the mixed hexamer, you denatured and renatured it, the it behaved differently than uh, you know when the mutant state was in the uniform hexamer mutant state. Absolutely, that's so, right. So yeah, and that so that obviously means the monomers are somehow communicating with each other. Correct. And yeah, okay. So I took out the slide which actually shows how that communication occurs. As you know, Phil, um, NMR is really very valuable at looking at very subtle structural changes. We're not talking about big, you know, changes to the anatomy that you can see, you know, and clearly via crystallography. NMR has the blessing and the curse that the technology is very sensitive to very subtle changes. That's great. You want to be able to see very subtle changes. You also want to be able to understand them. Sometimes the changes are so subtle that you can't understand them. But what, what is very clear is that, uh, is that we can trace an allosteric pathway from the two uh, protomers that are on the sides 
of the particular protomer that we're looking at that allows us to begin to understand how it is that these protomers these can be talking with their neighbors. Okay. So we have some clue of, in terms of how that happens, but absolutely, a protomer, uh, a disease mutant protomer is influenced by the surroundings. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of interactions between the end terminal, between the arm, the end terminal domain, and the D1 domain in the down state. Now, if you form a disease mutant, so if you imagine I have a lot of interactions with my arm and the side, but I've got disease mutants right here, which causes things to move up. Now I don't have the interactions, and so I can begin to interact with my neighbors. By contrast, if you look at the wild type protomer, let's do the opposite experiment, we, which we've done. The wild type protomer in a sea of disease mutants really doesn't care about the disease. And the reason for that is because the wild type protomer is essentially down. There's a lot of intra-protomer interactions that are much stronger than the subtle inter-protomer interactions, which would otherwise govern the equilibrium in the case of, 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 of looking at the disease protomer. So I guess the, then the question would be, would the disease states, I mean, would they be 100% disease, like genetically encoded, or would they somehow 10%? I mean, could you get a disease based on a portion being a mutant, or does it have to be 100%? Yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. We don't really know, you know, how much do you need? If you take a, if you have these, these, these hexamers, is, is, is one protomer disease enough in, in the context of a hexamer? Now, I presume that what happens, and again, this is a presumption and I don't know, because I don't know, say, differential expression levels of wild-type protomer versus disease protomer. This is really where I need somebody who's a serious biologist to do CRISPR, and, 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 and we have tried to set up a collaboration to address those sorts of questions. You know, what's the distribution of disease versus wild-type protomer uh, in the cell? We know that there are uh, not only, uh, you know, complete homogeneous particles. There's not just disease particles and non-disease particles in the test tube or in E. coli, which is something that we can do in my lab fairly easily. If we express both disease and wild type, at the end of the day, we don't have any just disease and any just wild type. We have a mixture. Now, so we have a, so there's, I mentioned that this is a very dynamic system. It's a dynamic system on lots of levels. Not only do you have the up-down equilibrium, not only do you have the squishiness, but you also have the protomers uh, that can be dynamic. Uh, and we know that from an exchange perspective, because we can take uh, protomer or, or, or molecules that are wild type, molecules that are disease, we can mix them uh, just in the test tube overnight at 37 degrees, and we come the next day and we've got a 100% mix. So these things are moving about you know, from one molecule to the next. And we think that that's important in terms of the function of P97. One of the things that P97 is known to do is to serve as a disaggregase. We have structures of related molecules to P97, actually the homologue in archaea called VAT, where we can watch one VAT molecule actually unfold another VAT molecule. And it does so through the protomers, and there are six that basically, if you climb a rope, you know, you put one hand ahead of the next. So imagine now that you've got six hands, and each hand is progressively going up the rope. So that, what that means is the interactions between protomers, despite the fact that we're sequestering 10,000 square angstroms, have to be sufficiently plastic to allow for this process to occur. So we think that there are dynamics which come about due to the actual function. But what that means is that even if you could produce a P97 that is homogeneous wild type and a P97 that is homogeneous disease, if they get close in the cell, they're probably going to interchange. Certainly they do in the test tube, and certainly they do in E. coli, and certainly they also do in, 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 in uh, mammalian models, because others have done that and shown that you end up with mixtures. What the exact nature of the mixtures are remains to be established. Okay, I think that formally we should uh, call an end to proceedings, but while we're packing up here, if anybody has any individual questions that won't just come down, and we, we do have a little bit of time, we do have to get going soon. But I'd like to thank Lewis again for this thank you. exciting tour through technology development and the physics and the chemistry involved to being able to address very important biological questions. And so 
that's the way science is done. Um, kind of collaborations and multidisciplinary, and uh, here's an example. So thank you very much. Thank you.